Rex started seven years ago when a friend of mine, my best friend and, and a long-time colleague, Robert Irvin, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis um, with MS. He had um, phoned me at work one day and says, you know, I've got a dose of the MS and there's a fair chance I'm going to need a wheelchair. And both myself and himself, our mothers were in chairs, so we'd experienced a little bit of the reasons of that things could be sometimes a little bit difficult in a chair, access and attitudinal barriers that people sometimes experience. My mum is in a chair from a stroke and his from MS, so he kind of knew some of what his future might look like, although it's a very different thing for every individual person. And I'd just seen these, these cases where my mother had been a big, strong farm girl and she'd been out walking with her dogs every day and, and suddenly when she goes out in a chair, people were saying, does she want a cup of tea? She obviously can't talk for herself because she's sitting down, you know. So we thought we'd build a set of robotic legs, as you do when you're a couple of engineers. We can't fix MS. We don't know how to do that. Um, but we did think we would be able to fix this, what we seen at the time as a mobility problem, you know, the, the stairs and, and getting people at eye level. And that was where we sort of started out. Um, we hadn't been involved in robotics like that. We looked around. The technology didn't exist at that time. I, there was nothing out there as a competitor. There still isn't anything out there as a direct competitor to Rex or some similar stuff and similar technologies, but, but nothing that we could point to. So we thought we'd build our own. So we started this conversation on the phone for about six months. We're both working in the UK at the time. Um, kind of a reverse OE. I've been here for 18 years. I'm a Kiwi by choice. I love New Zealand and I love manufacturing stuff in New Zealand. And I think we can do that really well down here. And. Um, we started talking about this, this robotic exoskeleton we were going to build. Six months later, we both came back to New Zealand. We said, we either shut up about it or we start building it. So we took to the garage, you know. He took to his, I took to mine. I had a half-sized normal house garage um, set up to work in. And we started building this robotic exoskeleton. And we started, we say, one step at a time. We, we built a knee and it was a bit of metal with a, a, a joint in the middle and it could bend. And then we stuck an actuator on it a motor on it and made it, made it motorised. Then we made a, an ankle the same. And we didn't talk to anybody. We didn't tell any funders and we didn't talk to any users, which is kind of a strange way to develop things sometimes. But we're very aware that we didn't want to actually create any expectations that we couldn't meet. We didn't want a commercial pressure to deliver something that we weren't happy with or couldn't meet. And we didn't want to actually set any expectations with users and kind of come with an attitude that we will save you, you know. We, we just wanted to try and see where we're going to go and, and if we could actually manage to deliver this, if we could develop this technology. And after four years in the garage and lots of late nights and lots of weekends, we actually had a machine which I often say had wooden feet and, and a drain pipe for an arm, you know. But it could sit and it could stand and it could kind of walk, you know. And it could kind of support a person and it was a real proof of concept, you know. And when we drew this thing up, we said, look, it has to be able to walk. You've got to be able to stand first off. You've got to be able to walk. You've got to be able to go forwards and backwards and to the side. We sort of said it had to be able to do stairs. You'd have to be able to do slopes because there's accessible ramps and, you know, malls and universities and things like that. We wouldn't be able to do Mount Everest. That was shooting for too much, you know. And we kind of likened it to the Wright brothers. You know, we said, we had this analogy at the start. that We said, look, you can't imagine those guys sitting in a shed saying, we need 400 seats. We'll need a microwave. We'll need an entertainment system, you know. <laughs> Uh, we'll need first class, business class, cattle class, and, and you know, we'll need a, a cheap one. And you know, it just wasn't going to happen. You know? We were never going to get there. It was going to take 100 years. And we really felt a pull. You know, the more we learned about this, and the more we studied, and the more we researched, and the more people that we got to know, although we weren't still really interacting with people, we realized you know, that, that there was a pull for this. There was a real people need out there. This was a, this was a real problem. You know? and we started to feel it belonged to somebody else. It didn't belong to us. It wasn't, certainly wasn't a commercial thing for us because and they made more money elsewhere, you know. Um, it became more about actually delivering it for the users. And somewhere along the way, and I don't know where, it changed from being ours to being something we just had to deliver it. It became a very personal thing, even past Robbie, even past our mothers. If you sit in a chair, you become contracted. You lose bone density. You start to have urinary tract infections. You start to have spasms, depending on how, you, how you're in a chair or why you're in a chair, you have all these, these other issues that are bigger actually than the chair in itself and bigger than the, probably the first reason that you, that you ended up using a chair. So there was all these medical benefits and one of the great things we say now, we've changed the story and I'm jumping ahead a wee bit, but one of the things now that just really drives us is people use the machine and they go, I just feel great. 
I use the machine first thing in the morning when I've, at the end of the day I've still got some energy and I've still got time for the wife and the kids, you know. And it feels really good. And this started to become the pool as well. So after the four years in the garage jumping back again, we, um, we actually started talking to users and we actually went out and talked to investors and we got some funding for Rex. We got a very small amount of money from a New Zealand venture capital company, a relatively small amount of money. It's quite big by most people's standards. Relatively small amount of money to get us going through the next year to actually get us up to building something that looked like a product. It was covered and it looked like something. You didn't need too much imagination to know how this thing was going to work. It was still too fat and too slow and too medical looking, frankly. Um, but it was, it was getting closer. It was that intermediary step between this proof of concept and us actually being able to deliver a real product. We had some help from the New Zealand government, from the Foundation for Research Science and Technology. We had help in terms of funding, but also just in moral support, because this is a long journey, you know, seven years, and you're pretty much on your own, you know, you're, you're the only two, three, four people that are actually running and driving this thing, and every day you're, you're fighting off issues, people issues, money issues, suppliers not delivering issues, you name an issue and they get thrown at you when you're trying to do something like this. And it's a lonely old place, you know. There's not a lot of people there beside you. There's other inventors who are doing similar things and we get to know some of those through our, through our funders and through some of the foundation stuff. But the foundation come in and they supported us with their moral support and with, you know, other suppliers and people that might be able to help and, and just actually being there for us too, as well as, as giving us money, you know. And we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. We got ourselves a hardware engineer, a software engineer, people that knew more about this thing than I did because I was starting to reach the end of my knowledge. So you have to bring in all these other specialist skills and with that you bring in people and with people come people issues as well, you know. So you start to get all these different personalities that you have to deal with too. And we have 25 amazing engineers now. They're just the top of their game anywhere in the world. I would defy anybody to find better, you know. And. Um, they're not led either. They've actually bought this story along the way too. And, and really, Rex is a story. Because when you start out on this journey as well, you don't actually have anything. The proof of concept was some bits of steel with some motors that kind of did a job. You needed some real vision to come in and, and put your money where your mouth was and see how that would actually one day be a product and one day have had the, the wonderful launch that we've had just recently that you've seen. Um, was still to be a commercial success and sell the things and make enough money to pay all that stuff back. You need these people that, that, that actually get you along there. And like I say, we've got about 25 engineers now. We've got about five people supporting them. We'll probably double in size in the next year. But we, you know, we were starting to get there. And about a year ago, we started engaging wider with our market and we started running our first clinical trial where we had, and it's not a very clinical trial. It's um, under the, the approval of the New Zealand National Ethics Committee, which is fantastic. That was a real lesson for us as well and putting all the safety and protection for our users um, in place. And then we had people coming in who were strangers to us who would come in and they would have all people being different, you know, different issues that they would bring along, different health concerns that they would bring. And we learned more about our community and about how we might deal with that and um, started putting people in wrecks and started to get this real user feedback. And, and then we really knew, you know, we had something that was going to be going to be big in terms of its impact on people, not necessarily big in terms of its commercial success, although obviously we're hoping for that as well. And it, it kind of brings us to, to the current day. I haven't watched my time, but brings us nearer to the current day where today we're completing trials. We're completing our safety certification because you can't just sell a medical device anywhere. It actually needs you know, electrical safety testing, you know, immunity to radiation and magnetics and other stuff. You, and back where we started there and we said it had to be something that was safe, it had to do those functions, but it had to be safe, it had to have a practical range, you had to be able to go somewhere and get back, you know, rather than getting stuck there. So now we start to get to the present day, you know, where we have this machine and, and for hundreds and hundreds of hours we had people testing the machine and, and we used to test it till it break and the machine would go and then it would snap and it would break and it would take us two weeks to build another one and then we'd, we'd go again and because of all that hard work, you know, well actually now when people come into the device, they get in and they're being measured up. Each device is individually sized for people and they get into their, their own custom customised device and they can press a button and it enables them to stand after a few fitment sessions and making sure they're properly aligned and comfortable. They can stand, they can press a button and they can walk. They can walk in any direction. They can go up and down slopes. They can go up and down stairs. And we have returned that, that, that functionality that we talked about, that mobility functionality. But more than that, like I said earlier, when, when somebody uses the device and we're running their trials, people are saying, I want to come in first thing in the morning. 
because I just feel good for the rest of the day. And, and there's the payback, you know. It's not the commercial success. The commercial success, we need to keep building these machines and keep, and keep servicing our community and giving them you know, a Rolls Royce service like you've never seen before, hopefully. Um, but it's actually that. I just feel really great when I use this machine, and, and that's absolutely our payback. That's what drives us every day. This has become our world. I always say that disability, is, it's addictive, you know, once you get in it. And we've realized along the way, too, that we just didn't want to build a robotic exoskeleton. And what we realized is we have a unique set of engineering skills along the way, and that there's a unique set of problems across here that we can actually bring our skills to help solve, you know. So we have this very close relationship with with all the other things that are trying to be done, not just the medical products and cures and, and stuff like that too, but you know, trying to bring some of our skills to some of those issues. So for Rex, really, this is just the beginning and, and not the end. And we had that wonderful launch. We were big in 143 countries. We were on the hour every hour in Mongolia and Kuala Lumpur, you know. Um, we've had heaps of inquiries from Turkey, you know, and Canada and places that you just wouldn't think would be really big in mobility. Um, hundreds of sales leads, hundreds of inquiries about being a distributor, inquiries about investing in the business and all those wonderful things. And people phoning up and saying, I want one, you know. So that's the start of Rex Bionics and, and not the end.